Let's see. Okay. So, yeah, so this is uh, the work uh, done in collaboration with one of my senior colleague, Aditya. And uh, both of us were advised by advisor Srinath Srinivas at IIITB in Bangalore. Uh, I, I speak about something which is uh, which gives some introduction to memory models here so that's not part of the computer science as such but the whole idea here is to understand uh, the current memory models and uh, can we somehow create a representative models which can be helpful in uh, solving some text mining problems. So uh, this is the agenda. So uh, I'll talk about the UI memory and then I'll talk about a few of the available memory models. Uh, if time permits, I'll look into one of these problems, probably topic expansion. So, uh, from the point of view of cognitive uh, uh, inspiration, and uh, then further see how did we solve it. So, the the first question is why memory? So, why are we focusing on memory when we are trying to solve problems? Uh, so if you see, we can draw parallels with a lot of text mining tasks. Uh, one is retrieval, another is thinking. So retrieval is same as uh, the information <coughs> extraction kind of thing. Uh, thinking is like inferencing. Then uh, we need a, a faster processing. So there is, uh, uh, in cognitive science, there are concepts of system one, system two. Uh, so there is a lot of approximation seen in uh, the processing. Uh, can we do that? Uh, then there are quite a few interesting phenomena like abstraction. So we store, if we see multiple things we uh, of similar kind, then we store an abstract idea about that. So if we see a Pomeranian dog and a Labrador, so we have we create a larger generic entity called dog. That's very interesting. Then, uh, 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 then uh, we store inferences made about a lot of entities as well. So in our memory. So these are all very important phenomena for any kind of data processing in today's world. So because we are processing text, so we will talk only about text mining. Uh, before getting into how did we attempt to do something, uh, we'll look into some of the memory models. So this, this, these are uh, uh, few of the memory models which are uh, available and there are quite a few memory models which even contradict the ideas here. So uh, it's not that these are important and they are not, but uh, these memory models give a, a flow into the categorization of memory. So I've put them here. Uh, the first, uh, so all of them uh, derive the major motivation from this case of HM. So uh, uh, his name was uh, Henry, which was revealed around seven, eight years back or something like that. Uh, before that, uh, the person was known as HM because it was a clinical uh, study. So you were not supposed to reveal the person's name. So. Uh, in 57, 1957 or odd, sometime then, uh, he was uh, diagnosed with uh, epileptic attacks. So his epileptic seizures were so severe that they had to do a surgery. Uh, so the it was a brain surgery and they actually removed a part of his brain. So, and because of that his epileptic attacks stopped. But what happened is he stopped collecting memory. So he stopped collecting some kind of memory. So what he stopped collecting is so about the things which he was experiencing. Whereas he could still learn a lot of things uh, which were, uh, uh, for example, uh, how to swim kind of things he could still learn. But what he could not learn is, uh, what he could not retain is his experiences. So people started telling, okay, then if a part of 
brain if it is been removed and it is causing only one kind of problem then there is a kind of clear cut idea that uh, these are there are separate types of memories so this this led to lot of research and one of the models by atkinson and uh, shifrin uh, is uh, this is a major breakthrough work to uh, give three types of memories so what it talks about is sensory memory short term memory and long term memory so what they how did they say uh, that there are three types of memories they said that the way the data is received in these memories and then the way it is processed and the way it is stored are different in all three things so uh, this was the uh, model they proposed they what they said is there is a sensory memory and then data from that if we pay attention to the data here it goes to short term and then if we pay attention to that it goes to long term and long term and short term memories interact so uh, what does sensory memory do, uh, do it, it it collects various sensory inputs and it is a very short term memory it doesn't keep it for long so anything you look it is there with you for some seconds anything you hear probably is there at most around 20 seconds so uh, so it's a very short term memory and if you don't pay attention to this then this is lost but uh, but for the sensory memory you are familiar with how different senses are right mm-hmm. so you 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 save those kind of stuff in your brain like you know the touch is different than the smell and yes. so on right yes. so you you know that the thing is like you are familiar with bad smell yes so if you if you smell a bad smell it's a short memory but it's still you know it so you are saving it somewhere else too right? no if you have paid attention to it then only you can understand it is a bad smell so is your concern about the preservation of the modality or the preservation of the of the concept the concept okay so so i th- But I think when he tells the rest of the story what's going to happen is that 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 bad smell mm-hmm. is going to go into short term memory and it will be oh. represented there semantically if it is to be encoded in long term memory that's the usual story yeah. behind these box models yeah of how it works okay. so but and then the, then the question is what happens to the old factory foundations of this memory and how is that accommodated by long term memory and you're probably not going to go there so no. um but that's a when when Ahmed is worried about multiple modalities in thought that's where that kind of issue i don't think he's going in the direction of olfactory memory but you know but but other visual memory and auditory memory and things like that are are vulnerable to the same comment yeah. so uh, this there is no processing happening here so what what we have to understand there is it's just collecting data so if you pay attention to that data then it gets into the short term and then the long term there the actual semantics comes into the picture if you see here what comes is just data and you you lose it if you don't pay attention to it so it's a kind of stream entry point so then what happens is then there is a short term memory uh, where uh, um, you can st- hold this information for some time so yeah there are quite a few uh, uh, disputing ideas uh, about the, so there is something called working memory which is an alternate for short term memory and there are uh, theories which actually consider both of them so the but if you see the idea here is that you can hold only certain amount of memory in this place so and uh, so one of the uh, argument is that you can have seven plus or minus two chunks so that the pro- you can do some processing on that so our context is usually stored here uh, when we want to work on that so we we i i tell you jackfruit so i don't know how many people know jackfruit or watermelon 
So now what what happens is those the information related to those concepts are brought into your working memory from from this place. So and now you can work on it. That's the idea. And whenever you do something here and whenever something comes here, if it is required for long time storage, then it gets here. So this this is one model proposed without uh, much further classification in 1968. So, yeah, so I spoke about long-term memory. So what long-term memory, the talk is that uh, it's not time-bound storage. So once you get into it, the more you use it, the more uh, you retain it. So that's how the long-term memory works. Then uh, it also stores some uh, semantics related to the data you have received. So you might have pre, uh, you might pre-process like generalization and all such kind of things might have happened. Then uh, there was one study in uh, 1999 which talks about uh, one billion bit equivalence of this memory store. So that's something. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't read through this completely, but I have gone through the soft articles about this. So. Probably if somebody knows how did they come with this number, they can discuss. Uh, then uh, another model is uh, Squares model. So it's proposed in 1987. Uh, it focused, so the, if you see the previous model focused more on the complete memory uh, flow kind of thing. Box, the boxes represented all the three types of memories. Uh, Square focused on long term memory. So he said, okay, let me look into this. He said there are two kinds of long-term memories. One is declarative memory, another is procedural memory. So declarative memory contains knowledge, ideas, information, and stories. So you know that, okay, you remember that you had a, an accident and a fight with someone. You remember that this is a dog. You remember that um, and the uh, smiling dog doesn't bite or something like that. I don't know so whether you remember or not. So, so and uh, uh, what the interesting part about this memory is that you can verbally report it. So I'll, I'll so probably when I get to a procedural memory, you'll realize what do I mean by verbally report it. So here in past procedural memory, uh, it it stores skills and sequence of behavior. So how to play guitar, how to swim, how to bicycle, so all those kind of things. Now, so if you, here if you, you can narrate a story of your fight and the person in front of you who is listening to you understands it almost everything. So you can transfer the data, the information as it is or with very little uh, uh, loss. But what happens here, if you know how to play guitar, you cannot transfer it. Unless you put enough effort and the person in front practically does it. So there are two different kinds of memories. Uh, so so this is, this was the state once uh, uh, the memory model talked about uh, long-term memory. It said it, there is a declarative and non-declarative version. Then Tulwin came up with uh, further classification. So he said, okay, uh, the declarative memory, which can be explained, can be further subdivided. So he said, okay, uh, there is a one memory which stores general knowledge, another memory chunk which stores events. So, if the, the, the memory stores general knowledge is called semantic memory, uh, it, it, is, uh, it contains what one knows about things. So, uh, it stores meaning, fact, so ideas, generalizations, and quite a few such things. And it doesn't <coughs> store the temporal information. So, what do we mean by temporal information? It stores Eight dates, years, and all, but it doesn't attach 
temporal information about, uh, for example, if, if you know that dog has four legs, you don't know when did you learn it. So there is no way, so the semantic memory is about the current consistent state of your knowledge. You don't know. Uh, whereas the episodic memory is autobiographical in nature. So it contains one's own experiences. So you know, so here you, if you see, uh, you know that this is a vehicle, but you may not remember where did you learn that this is a vehicle. But the same thing, if you f see a car like this, I'm sure you're going to remember it. So where did you know, see it? When did you see it? There are quite a few contextual informations and your experience with it, all those things will be remembered. So similarly, you'll remember, okay, somebody was, when somebody was born, when somebody died and all, all such kind of things. There are incidents, events which are uh, remembered. So, so, so if far, um, there isn't much discussion of the explicit uh, knowledge that person has, that a uh, person relates to um, and perhaps builds more, builds more memory with that. Yeah, so what happens is uh, uh, this semantic and episodic memories interact. So probably you can throw some more light on that. The question is, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, I'm sure others have talked about, but the, those the examples you said so far, mm -hmm. they don't they don't explicitly talk about existing knowledge and experiences, right? Yeah, well, they they, they, they might, mm -hmm. um, but there there are other there are other resources that would be more specific about the contents of episodic memory and the content uh, contents of semantic memory mm -hmm. than you're talking about here. I mean, most of what most of what informs this perspective mm -hmm. is sort of general psychological experiments. Mm -hmm. If you want to know the contents, if you want the detailed contents of the models inside these, you got to look someplace else. And I would look at John Anderson's work or or um, uh, Al Newell's work or somebody, somebody like that. If, if if that's what you want. Right? Well, so so I'm more thinking like uh, I go to somebody's birthday party mm -hmm. and immediately. I also register the that person's birth date, which is not, you know, which is a different thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's because I have common sense knowledge that you know, there's but the, the party is on the birth date, as yes. an example, right? Yeah, yeah, that is your episodic memory. Well, no, 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 no that's no, going to no, be no. there's going to be some general knowledge there about yeah, about common what sense knowledge. about birthday parties and what they mean and whatever. Yeah, so for for so all that, you know. They're not independent of each other, yeah. right? So. You know, for, I'd, I'd also look at, you know, I'd obviously I'd look at, you know, Roger Shank and people like that for, mm -hmm. for the contents of, the, of those models. These people are really talking mostly about the organization of the various memory systems. And the detailed logic and the reasoning inside of them, these, these citations aren't the places to go looking yes. for that. There are other places, but it's just these, these people laid out the framework, I yes. would say. Yes, and what they say, they're not completely exclusive to each other. So when you store your episode, you use content from semantic memory. And uh, the episodes, once again, go and enrich your semantic memory because you would have learned something in that episode. So that goes and once again enriches semantic memory. Uh, let, me, let me add one more thing, yeah. and especially thinking about uh, you know, adding Roger Shank and thinking about Ahmed's question here. Mm -hmm. There are people who question mm -hmm. this division between semantic and episodic memory mm -hmm. precisely for the reasons that you're talking about, Amit. It seems like it's not possible yeah. to comprehend the episode without pulling in all of your semantic memory, your background knowledge. And so that people start saying, well, exactly where is the dividing line here between these? So one, one way to think about this is that sort of your, your semantic memory is sort of the top, top down stuff and the episodic memory would be instantiations or leaf node examples of the, of the semantic memory. That's one way that people kind of straighten this out. Um, and one reason that um, I, I uh, bring in Shank for this is because of his emphasis on the notion, you, you do know about case-based reasoning, right? Have you heard about 
case-based reasoning. Okay, so case-based reasoning is at the level of specific episodes and, and instances. And so that really highlights the problems of this particular distinction between episodes. Everybody has read uh, Shank's uh, write-up and uh, he's uh, yeah. explicitly mentioned that I invented case-based reasoning at the end. Right? Yes, you all yes, remember he did that, say right? that. You read that? He, he yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but uh, probably uh, these are few of the distincting factors yeah. which logically separate out uh, semantic and uh, uh, episodic memory. So, one is uh, episodic memory stores experiences and events, whereas semantic memory stores facts, meanings, and concepts. This is autobiographical in nature, and this is general knowledge. So, so here you remember some accident, whereas here you know that a dog has four legs. That's something like that. Uh, time and space. I a dog but, has four legs. Yeah, you know so, that you have seen, but you don't know when have you seen. Where have you seen? First time, maybe as a but, child. But you Not remember that? Exactly. Do you remember? Do you remember? But, but obviously, as a child. Well, yeah, but but there's no there there's nothing in your memory system that that records. The, the records that, that you are that. inferring now. You are not retrieving. What yeah. you are doing is you are inferring by thinking that okay, when where probably where would I have seen. So is it the question is whether uh, this memory becomes generalized and yeah. then it drops out some of the unnecessary details okay. of exactly having seen the very first thing. Okay. Your memory is the other interesting thing is that you you know you you notice that you know probably the dog has four legs. Uh, in your first, uh, second, third year, uh, in your memory, your brain has changed substantially after that. <laughs> you don't know how, how yeah. what it retains and what it gives up and all that stuff, right? And this has uh, something to do with information knowledge, right? we can say knowledge. Meaning what? Right, but so nice. from nice. individual nice. incidents, nice. the brain kind of created a general knowledge. That's the interesting thing. Yes. Right. Yeah. Semantic. The brain yes. created, right? You, you saw, you know, if somebody said doggy in, in a uh, picture, Somebody had actually pet dog, and sees you know this this dog you know whatever. Those very specific details may that somebody said you know and then you are noticing there is four legs. See very interestingly is quite likely nobody told you dog has four legs. That somebody introduced you concept of leg that human has four leg and you saw the four and you actually might come up to your own conclusion without somebody having actually said that the dog has four legs. Or somebody might have said it either, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Having done all that, you know, you may decide that that fact is not important anymore. Your brain somehow decides that the fact is not important anymore, and it remembers dog is four leg as a general knowledge. Uh, dog can also have third leg, you know, three legs because it, you know, one is broken or whatever. And uh, it, it it leaves out this thing where you know. It's just too old a memory, or it is not important. We don't know, right? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure so, uh, logic, you know, people have uh, conjecture whether it is because it's not important, or is it because uh, uh, we need more space in our memory, or because uh, you know you don't use that particular incidence, but you use the general knowledge very often. Yes, she has asked. Yeah. Yeah. Versus losing out that episode are two different things. So if if you still have that memory, I think everybody has that. This month, actually, uh, but because, it's yeah. I mean, I don't know what happened. That past I mean, instance when really maybe we don't retrieve actually very explicit minor details, uh -huh. but it exists. I mean, and then if we are unable. 
there are ways that at least I haven't read any literature in this aspect. Which yeah, well, there is this literature on, on like false memories and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm having, uh, I'm just going to take me uh, a while to remember who it is that does this stuff. Um, but, um, you know, like, like uh, children testifying in criminal cases about child abuse and things like that. So they'll have one, one memory initially, and then you poke at them and you know and they'll yeah. retrieve some other things and then the question is are they retrieving things that really happened or are they filling in details from semantic memory things that are consistent with you know what with what could have happened but didn't really happen so there are there are people who worry about you know exactly what we can remember and what it means to to retrieve things that were uh, formerly ir ir irretrievable. So I read um, an article. About Loftus, <laughs> Beth Loftus. See, I just retrieved something. That's the what. That's the, Beth Loftus is the person who who does this work. So, L O F T U S. Yeah. So even the semantics can be changed. I read an article about like hacking three hacking memories, or this is what they call it. Mm. What they, what they mean by yeah. this is actually they they have even a, t a therapy treatment, like they put some. For example, a soldier from a battlefield, okay. and then they start when he's sleeping, like having the sounds of the bullets shooting, uh -huh. and then putting something, like they infuse something inside that whole process to make it better, better for him. Uh -huh. And then when he wakes up, he starts having different <laughs> yeah. uh, experience about these yeah. things. So we're getting very clinical here. I don't know very much yeah, about I mean, clinical yes. stuff, but 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 the but there are people who worry uh, precisely about what's in memory and how you can add retrieval cues without um, actually distorting, which is what you're talking about, mm -hmm. distorting memory. So I have a question. What happens if you have something which is contradictory to your previous semantic yeah. knowledge? See, that's, that's where I got all, all yeah. upset with the SOA paper. Yeah. I didn't like the way that was handled. What do you want? So so I think, uh, think uh, what happens probably is an emotional reaction. What kind of emotion is something which is very different? See, I think you're just wrong. I think we have knowledge soup, mm -hmm. and we have all this junk in different domains, mm -hmm. and, and rarely mm -hmm. are we in a circumstance where two conflicting pieces of knowledge collide, yeah. and we go, oh, blank, um, and, and have to fix it. But most of the time, it just it's knowledge it. soup junk. And the place where this is most important is sociocultural phenomena, conflicting sociocultural rules. So, so he talks in medical domains. Yes, it is. Why is that? Noisy data. I don't no, know. No, because medicine is sociocultural. Oh. So why why is this knowledge soup so unscientific thing put up there? Which one? The this knowledge soup is, looks to me very unscientific. There's really nothing. No, I don't think it's a problem at all. I just I don't worry very much about about you know what I know about cooking and what I know about writing papers. It's really a very unusual that I would be cooking and write well okay maybe not uh, cooking and writing a paper at the same time. Um, so it's just not important for me to tease out the deep interactions between those two pieces of, of, of my life generally. Um. And, and, and I do it as an as-needed basis. And consistency management is a very difficult task. Yeah. So, yeah. By, so what I meant, so I, let me correct. What I meant by emotional reaction is when these two knowledge pieces come together. Could collide, yeah. So either there is a laughter or a cry or sadness because you are there with two contradicting pieces of knowledge. So, I mean, this is a, I'm not, this is not <laughs> from any literature. Yeah, yeah. So this is my opinion, uh, so which is, so you might it's just... It's the oh, expletive um, reaction. <laughs> yeah. so. How is my, uh, medicine social cultural? Uh, well, we, uh, you know, we, we do want to let Sumant do okay. his thing, okay? But I'll, but I'll let me give you some, just one example. Pregnancy. Pregnancy in Western cultures is treated as a medical problem. I assure you that for many thousands and millions of years, women were giving birth without hospitals, 
without anesthesia, without doctors, without all this. We've been doing, and and many other creatures give birth, and we don't think of it as a medical. It's only problem. thousands, not millions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, but you know, lo a long, long time. So, and there's lots of things that are that are like that, where you know we 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 import. Um, natural phenomena and behavior over into a community of practice because that community of practice has been has developed to handle that that situation uh, another really good one is um, um, mental health and um, drug addiction those are and if you read the anthropological literature they'll talk about how the medical community has appropriated those phenomena and taken them from you know, you could have thought of mental health issues as religious. Sure, there's a there's a whole there's a whole history of 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 treating the mentally ill as possessed. Okay, so it's a religious problem. So there's those those kinds of issues. <laughs> Your bua, huh? There's, there's a role called bua. There's a, you know right. You don't know. Well, the, the guys in India, there's this thing, you know, they. The guys who. Yeah. Can you please play a video about that? Probably at the end of this we uh, we can do a practical session on that. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. So, there are a couple of more interesting things like uh, iterative exposure to similar episodes might decay an episode. So, if you look at a dog with four legs continuously every day, you may not remember where did you see a dog having four legs when for the first time. So, the temporal information gets decayed here. Whereas, uh, in your semantic memory, uh, I, uh, so, you the more you activate it, the more stronger the relation becomes. So you use some concepts, and those concepts remain, and the concepts which are not used usually get decayed away. So, yeah, so this is the current block structure of the memories looks something like this. So this is our uh, uh, short-term memory and sensory. So this itself has a lot of conflicting uh, theories. So probably Valerie will talk about it sometime. It's and, not really uh, my area, but OK. <laughs> yeah. So then uh, this is one which talks about uh, declarative and non-declarative memory. Uh, non-declarative memory talks about non-verbalizable uh, memory, like procedural memory, then uh, perceptual memory. Then Classic. So these are once again. I'll not get into that. Uh, declare it. Yeah. Can you uh, give an example of perceptual representation system? Like, what do you mean by that? You want me to do that one? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there's a there's a, a a line of work on mental imagery, okay. maps, how we how we navigate. It doesn't look like the way to think about about your spatial knowledge is some kind of list of locations and how far they are away from each other, it seems like we have the capacity to store images okay. directly and operate on those images in ways that, that are not apparent or supported in a, in a declarative way. That's the uh, Roman map. Yeah, 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 I guess, yeah, yeah. But, you know, so I mean, perceptual representation, so you know um, if I ask you, if I ask you to memorize a map, and I ask you to tell me how far uh, object A is from object B in that map, the amount of time that it takes you to answer that question is proportionate to the distance of those of those objects mm -hmm. in the map. So there's just properties of perceptual representations that are not in the declarative uh, stuff. And the name there, the most important name there would be um, Steve Coslin, K-O-S-S-L-Y-N, Steve Coslin. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Yes? Excuse me, uh, could you please uh, show your screen? Oh, Whoa. gosh, that that's funny. terrible. Yeah. What happened? Oh, that's terrible. Oh, we apologize.
apologize. Yeah. We're very sorry. Okay. Sorry. No problem. Yeah, it's a problem. You should go to options. Graphic options. Okay. So I think it's, No, no, you should go through the Firefox. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Correct, right? Yeah. Yes. I love when this happens in a room full of computer scientists. Yeah. I just Maybe love it. It's yeah. It's not about <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like <laughs> the right top top of the video, I, you can share your screen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really sorry for that. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, and speak up next time. Yeah. As soon as you see a problem. Anyway, we have the video, so you can watch later also. Yeah. I think they try to chat, that's <laughs> They have many attempts to chat. Oh! <laughs> yeah, but we are oh, full we're screen, so. Oh, we're so bad. Yeah. Well, since like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, oh, sorry. we are so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we should monitor next time. Yeah. Just be one of the present, you know. Oh my God. Okay. So. Thank you, man. Thank, Thank you. Uh, well, uh, so, so here we are. Yeah, here we are. So <laughs> this this is how it looks. So the blocks block diagram of memory. So so this doesn't represent any dynamic structure between them. So probably that will be covered by someone else if required. Mm -hmm. So so what we were worried about is long term memory, uh, and especially in that uh, declarative memory. So because our idea was to extract semantics so we were telling that semantic memory is one of the most important memories to look for so and hence we started looking uh, so how did we go ahead and just talk for a couple of slides yeah. any questions please let me know so if somebody comes to a, a physician and then says pus wound pain inflammation so what would the physician diagnose it as? Something like an infection. So he did not mention that word, right? So this is a very common problem we see. I mean, how did he get to know? So assuming that both of them have some similar word view where the concepts are mapping. Uh, how did he, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So how did he map whatever that guy told into some topic is the kind of problem we were trying to look. Uh, this is the problem of Aditya. So this is called topical anchor. So I'll not talk about this, but this is to motivate how how did we start. So uh, for to solve this kind of problems, what we said is we can derive inspiration from human memory models, that is long term memory models, and then some analytical philosophy. Uh, I'll just couple of mentions I'll make about analytic philosophy because that's a deeper and once again has a lot of contradicting theories within and then some have been learning. So what uh, uh, analytic philosophy talks about is concepts being atomic in nature. So if I say cat you know it has some semantic attached with it. So which you will dispute I know but let us uh, so, uh, uh, so each word represents some set of concepts. For example, Java might represent Java programming language, island, then coffee. There are concepts which are grounded. That's what analytic. And a part of that is called distributional uh, hypothesis, which talks about deriving meaning from the concepts which are connected to it. So if Java is connected to C, you know that what meaning it gets there. A Java, so if, so there are concepts around other concepts and the co-occurrence gives some kind of meaning. So just, so hmm. why you are going to dispute this? <laughs> <laughs> it is very like, natural. I know. Okay. Yeah. I'll be quick. Yeah, no, no issues, no issues, no issues. So, so at least co cognitive scientists make a distinction between two kinds of semantics. 
one kind of semantics we call intentional. I-N-T-E-N-S-I-O-N-A-L. Intentional, okay? And, and that is the kind that Sumant is talking about here, where a concept takes on meaning because of what it's connected to. And you can infer the meaning of all of the objects with this integrated pattern, okay? The other form of semantics is extensional by extension of the concept onto the environment. So a cat, the word cat, or the idea of cat, maps onto some thing in the environment. And that's just, it's just a different dimension of semantics. And, and there, are, there are funny things that happen when um, people use symbols that, that challenge your intentional notion of semantics. One of them came up the other day in our Hazard Seas meeting. Uh, you're in a restaurant uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the server talks to the cashier and says, the ham sandwich wants his bill. Okay, it's not literally the ham sandwich that wants this bill, right? It is the person who is sitting at the table who ordered a ham sandwich wants the bill to, to, to pay for, okay? So, so there's a case where the symbol, the meaning of the symbol is not with reference to your intentional knowledge base. You can't take ham and sandwich and paste them together and come up with the reference for this at all, okay? What you have to do is think about how that symbol maps onto the world. Mm -hmm. Now, when I made this comment to Dr. Prasad, he said, okay, I get that. First of all, there's a name for this, it's called Matani. Um, and, um, and, and, his, and, and his response was, okay, that's a very hard problem for us computer scientists. We're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to solve that one. And then the next question is, well, how much of our employment of symbols, human employment of symbols, actually looks more like that than it does like what you can do? Granted, what you can do is important, but how are we going to get what you do to interface with this other very flexible, extensional, semantic capability that humans seem to have? That's sort of, that, that's kind of the worry. Another example of this um, problem is the dyptic words. The words that only take on meaning because of the context that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a good example of that would be all the pronouns. Mm -hmm. Okay, he, him, her, all those pronouns, those don't mean anything mm -hmm. apart from the specific referent that is only recoverable from context. There's other ones, today, yesterday, now, tomorrow, okay? So, you know, it doesn't take too long before I start expanding this network of symbols to you where you start scratching your head and you say, oh, I'm not sure my intentional semantics, the, 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 the um, semantic memory notions that he's talking about are going to do the trick at least for understanding how he how humans will interface with my with my system. Actually, some of the problems that you mentioned, there are some inherent problem of natural language processing, such as this one, we call it co-reference resolution. Yeah. The one that you said, okay, this pronoun has to like map to another concept or one person. Yes. It's address. I mean, it's not anymore a problem. No, it's not address completely. It is, uh, the precision is very yeah, it's yeah. Really, yeah, it's really yeah. So um, Hussein has another a, another instance um, in in his location analysis. Yeah. Um, he came up with he was looking at the Chennai floods and he he found the the word the words Ganapathi colony and Avadi road. And if you go and you look up in what I don't know what the, it, gazetteer. It, a gazetteer, yeah. it, it yeah. will give you a a point in space, a latitude, longitude for Ganapathi colony. Well, when somebody says Ganapathi colony is flooded, they don't mean this spot right here, this latitude and longitude. They mean the area. some yeah. area. So the, the meaning of that symbol is extensional. 
And, and we have to worry about that, right? Because we are in the business of interpreting that social media text. So, so just one thing. So intentional and exten extensional is going to like contradict each other or complement? Well, that's the question. How You know, I don't doubt what Sumant is saying. Of course there's some kind of semantic memory. Of course there's some intentional knowledge. I, 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 can't, under, I can't even imagine mm -hmm. doing doing without it. But what do you do with the fact that they're, you know, with the ham sandwich wants his paycheck, you know, or ha wants his bill? What do you do with that? And how do you, how do you know when your intentional processing methods are adequate and won't, and won't run into trouble as you try to, you know, align them with the world? How do you know what the boundary is? That's, that's yeah, the worry. Just one another point I want to add. So in the context of sentiment analysis, there are some efforts. For example, they mentioned that uh, this phone is big. No, no. Uh, this is a big phone. So, yes. So this big is going to refer to LCD. But it did, the LCD, LCD of this phone didn't, uh, wasn't there in the like uh, sentence. Okay. So how can you infer this kind of entity and try to map? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you need you need some semantic knowledge yeah. in order to in order to Definitely. fix that. Yeah. I so, you know I, I don't uh, I don't disagree. So the kind of problems. Yeah, I think this, uh, the problem of word sense disambiguation also is just considering context and try to get some meaning to the word in the context. But uh, still, that's one also is a. So, to address this, what we did is we said we are not going to solve contextual problems <laughs> <laughs> and solve problems which are general knowledge dependent. But you can see why, even for harassment, mm -hmm. we run into this yeah. into this issue, yeah. right? There are quite a few issues in harassment. Oh, yeah. Any of these that, projects that challenge this this yeah. assumption? That's true. That's true. So, so. It cannot solve all the problems, as simple as that. This can solve problems which are directly dependent on our general knowledge and not contextual knowledge. No contextual knowledge, only general knowledge. What you can solve, probably this model can address to an extent. So that is how, uh, probably, yeah, so that's how a PhD. So it's not giving any promises. Well, but think of it as, think of it like what, what Dr. Prasad said yesterday. Let's see how far we can get with this, and we will complicate the world as we need to. Now, the risk that, that John would, would identify is you are making, you have partitioned the problem. You have said, I'm going to deal with the intentional semantics, and I'm going to think about that, and I'm going to develop my system, and I am here saying, I'm worried about those extensional semantics, and you're saying, Valerie, have a nice time. And, and the hope is that, that the come two together. will come together in a coherent way. But somebody like John would likely say, by partitioning the problem in this way, you have actually eliminated the solution that you're going to need mm -hmm. in order to make a coherent yeah. perception, cognition, action system. That, so, but there's... That's just the way the scientific community works. I mean, you've got to you've got to cleave something and work on something. You can't work on everything all at yep. the same time. Especially not in your PhD. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Which is what this was, right? Uh, yeah. Exactly. So, so yeah. So then the third uh, motivation comes from heavy learning. So heavy learning talks about uh, uh, the connections between neurons in our brain uh, being established when two neurons get co-activated due to same input. So what it, so what we said is co-occurrence is one of these kinds of uh, phenomena where two related concepts come together, we ideally should bring them near in the graph rather than putting them away. Did you guys use self-organizing maps because that's exactly what it's about? Yeah, but we did not use any machine learning based techniques okay. in our, this one. We just use few few random walks and cl graph clustering algorithms. So, yeah. So, but yeah, I am aware that 
this does something similar to that. So, so this is what I wanted to talk about. So, uh, if you come across these episodes, so we define two kinds of semantics here, what we call as episodic semantics and analytic semantics. This analytic semantics is stored in semantic memory and episodic semantics is the, the, the episodes we come across. So if you come across an episode like this and another episode like this and one more episode like this, you will not just have them as three separate episodes, you might store them but you will not just have that, you will also have this inference. So, so uh, what is the analogy of these two, um, you know, something which may not may or may not be totally scientific. Mm -hmm. uh, I go to a, a music program mm -hmm. um, and there are a number of things happens, you know, let's say, I'm talking about Indian classical music program, there's a very nice piece of tabla going on, or there is um, some wonderful tan that went on mm -hmm. and I really, you know, enjoyed that particular piece. Mm -hmm. However, at the end of the day, you know, when it's all, the pro all this three hour program is done, mm -hmm. I have some composite memory, uh, I take, you know, with it, this guy is just very good in, you know, Alap and, uh, you know, and, and his voice was this quality and uh, he p plays, you know, similar to Jasraj and, I'm, you know, that's the kind of thing I will leave. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing that uh, episode you know, there's a parts of it that I observed and, um, right? You make inference. You make inference on that. And so then analytical, what you call analytical is like what, composite things that you go and remember for long term? You you take them for your life. Okay. Unless uh, The word analytical is a bit unusual there, but mm. anyway. No, this is... Does somebody use, use that or you guys... No, we, we talked about it because it's general knowledge. So when we say mm. analytical, mm. it's more about general knowledge. Mm. Uh, it doesn't have a clear cut context defined. So well, the way I would think about you, you go back to whenever Bush uh, and and, uh, Bush, yeah. and and trailblazing and connections, right? Uh -huh. So I may you know see something in that music program, uh -huh. but I'll be constantly connecting with things that I would know. So yes. I made a statement that he is you know he's, he sings um, similar you know is like in the tradition of Jasraj, right? Pandit Jasraj, you yeah. know, um, and and so I, of course I, I you know I, my knowledge base includes Jasraj. I have quite a bit of information about him right. and I just make connect to that right, right. And, and, uh, you know, and then I'll you know uh, so what happens here is you are your each these small small uh, experiences you are having is an episode mm. by itself mm. so it is going and affecting your semantic memory mm. so when you you put something in your semantic memory it just doesn't go and stay there it, it changes quite a few things around it it makes lot of comparisons it pre-processes a lot of semantics it generalizes. So that is what is happening over a period of episodes you are experiencing. So you might even forget about this concert down the line someday, but you might remember that he sings like this. Uh, so I just want to make one point, uh, is, you know, first of all point for some of our students who are um, interested in event stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, I think two, three students are interested in event. Um, you know, work and you know, you know, social media work or otherwise. In that, typically, um, you know, you you, see, you know, you can have a short-term event. You can have a long-lasting event. Uh, there is a taxonomy that Hemant had used in our People Content Network paper in World Wide Web 2011. And um, um, but the, you know, you find an uh, event you describe having certain types of features or certain types of properties. Let's say event would have time and location space and thematic element at this at, at the minimum. It may have some other things. In there is always in, there is a line of work where you have to identify singular components of value. Like if through information extraction you find a name of a person, you find a geolocation as you know Hussein will try to work on. And then, um, and, the, and the, all those then are brought together. So, you know, you say, well, the time proceeds and by time I, uh, you know, study this, this, this. The other day I was talking about the Iran election 2009. I said, well, it started this thing and then there was green guys and then there suddenly Neda was killed. And then, you know, and then, then there was uh, the movement changed and then those, uh, guards came about and all kinds of stuff, you know, there's components of them, right? So the sequel, you know, 
uh, you, you, individual things get composed into sort of sub events of kinds to the long term thing as a whole Iran election 2009, right? As we see that, and, and I think we won't be unique to, you know, uh, only to see that. The interesting thing where, where we may have a, an opportunity to do something unique is this thing about uh, connecting each of these things to the context provided by the knowledge that we would have. So some of you might have seen this picture that we have drawn on continuous semantics, right? We had an ontology for Iranian political system, Iranian, you know, whatever, uh, uh, all those concepts of, you know, um, uh, interesting, all the politicians were there, all the locations uh, where Tehran was there and everything like that. So we have all that knowledge. And the point here is that the potential uniqueness would be as we, uh, and not only do, we always also all talk about semantic annotation. So, you know, you link a concept we find in the data to concept. So you'll do that semantic association. But more interestingly, how are we improving the enhancement? How are we enhancing our understanding of what's happening by constantly utilizing that knowledge, which also itself continues to be built? You remember, uh, you recall that like Wikipedia would be constantly updated, and new you know entities and relations would be added to Wikipedia. If I'm extracting that and representing that as my collective knowledge, as a baseline to which I'm connected, doing the semantic association, right? Then I'm, um, uh, you know, my knowledge is also continuing to evolve, and it is that dynamic system that adds a lot more richness to uh, compared to what you typically would find on event monitoring event uh, understanding systems. So bringing in that matured, you know, that, that thing and more, you know, starting with some level of formal modeling where that knowledge, background knowledge, which itself continues to, just like data streams and, you know, new data comes, this knowledge continues to also evolve, continuous semantics kind of thing that you're depending with this evolving knowledge. Modeling that whole thing and then describing this event, you know, uh, work would it's an it's an opportunity that we are not yet fully realized. I think uh, Pavan already tackled part of that problem in the um, filtering. A, in a, in a, so yes, it's a, it's a, it's a, of course you know I talked to Pavan about these general things, but um, we have not come up with a concrete model for you know. So Pavan has not presented yet a, a model of event. Um, that we can actually create from data, but the, uh, we, incorporating these features that I mentioned. But the problem is with the knowledge base. Just mm. uh, like you are saying, you are talking about the evolving knowledge base. Mm. The problem is, uh, for example, he was relying on Wikipedia, mm. which sometimes after some evaluation, we found some paper, some pages that were like actually not being authored. Mm -hmm. until maybe the mid of the event or even the end of the event mm -hmm. or after like a year from the event has ended. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's another problem with the knowledge base itself. So, yeah. uh, You know, this, this does remind me of a fight that I'm having with Saida um, for, hazard, for hazard seas on the, no the knowledge base that we need for hazard seas. And I keep actually insisting that we want to make a distinction between the episodes mm -hmm. that are flowing by and the general knowledge that is used to interpret those episodes. And Saida wants to put them together, and, and, and that just makes me nervous as heck because, because there's, a, there's a, a dynamic nature to the, to, to the low-level events, and the high-level stuff doesn't change in the same way, although, as Ahmed is pointing out, it can change. And I, 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 so I think the distinction is useful, even though, even though no, the, we want to differentiate. I do want, I do yeah, want to keep so. that, I, I so want to keep that separate. Yeah, actually, uh, my question is exactly that, about that question. Uh, so right now we have a definition for fine grain events. So what you're referring is that we have, we should have a kind of more abstract events, what's running uh, yeah. I mean, more generalized view on a dynamic of, I mean, running events. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's, there's multiple layers. I mean, I, I do kind of think of this sort of in a Clark, so, A Clark hierarchy. Yeah. 
it's more looks like can you group a certain set of events to see them as a, another one event at a larger level and then see the dynamics or that. or more abstractly or whatever so and you, you you might have this running thing of the features in your, your environment that are change that are changing and you might interpret them in one way right. and then over time you realize you need a different way of thinking about them the phases of the disaster would be yep. one ex very good example of this right so you have the initial disaster where you're interpreting the features with respect to one facet of your of your um, semantic memory uh -huh. and then you know and then the very same things take on a different meaning because you're in a different phase of the of, of the of the situation well, even in our storm search model uh, the flow of That's water in one to, I mean, one point in a map is different than it from another right. point in the map it means so something to, different yeah yeah but yeah, but all of them together makes some Me, some interest. Some, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So since I think the idea. <laughs> what? <laughs> So, so this is a wonderful thing, but I want to challenge Sarasi and Saida to ensure that uh, this kind of stuff is um, incorporated in the knowledge um, graph generation platform uh, work that we do, okay? Yes, yeah, Saida's. Hmm. Yeah, so should we go ahead? So let us come to the ambition. This is the ambition. So when you have these episodes, so we derive something like this. So when we look at multiple documents, can we derive some general knowledge out of it like this? It's the ambition. So, uh, I spoke about heavy and learning, so I'll not speak about it. So these are the two things, questions we asked. So can we create a primitive representation model of semantic memory which can be used to mine various analytic semantics? that is general knowledge semantics and can the model be used or can the model be based on term co-occurrence or co-occurrence of the concepts that's uh, based on the heavy learning so uh, then I, I think probably I have spoken about this the, the topic expansion in other things so the idea was to create a co-occurrence graph then so I'll skip this part and then get into the idea how did the model looked. So, so this portion was our co-occurrence graph. So this is so these were the handcrafted algorithms. So each for each problem we came up with some algorithm. How did it happen? I will just explain. So the algorithms are going to sit here. Uh, they are going to look into the documents. So so how these three layers look are this. So Every document, so the idea of modeling it in three layers is this. Uh, we have language and we experience episodes and we build our general knowledge. These are the three things. So when I talk to you people, you are listening to me in a language. So if somebody who doesn't understand English here will not understand this. So that is the basic level of the communication that is the language constructs that is this is called linguistic layer and then what happens is once I speak out certain number of sentences or every sentence you make some episode out of it you create you understand it so that you are experiencing it and then you transfer that to your semantic memory if required so you change your general knowledge if required that's what is the model we set is the human communication going to be like. So now what happens is, so can we do the similar thing with machines? Can a machine read documents as a term distribution? Once again, you will have objections, I know, but this is where we start. Uh, and then each document can be converted into a click, that is the term co-occurrence click with weights and then can we put it in a larger co-occurrence graph and create a basic primitive representation. Do you think um, this term co-occurrence uh, as a basic construct um, mm -hmm. was uh, sufficient in your case? Do you think that if you went to 
something more like progressive graph models, you would have uh, been able to capture this thing more comprehensively. This also, we also come up with a lot of probabilistic constructs here. So we can use probabilistic graph models on this itself. So uh, what we thought of representing here uh, was a kind of probabilistic relations, if you see this getting converted into a probabilistic based relations between terms here. And now you can apply PGMs kind of things if you want, but we, we did not go. Mm -hmm. And is it important to see on which aspect the two things are related or is not that important? Uh, we don't consider aspects. So that's where we said we currently don't have any context. Aspect. No, I mean, yeah, I know in your work you haven't, but I mean the other side, the cognitive science side. Yes, it is. Uh, so probably one of the work, what I uh, did, this work, the topic expansion work, tries to identify the various senses of a given term. That is a kind of aspect mining. If you see, uh, if if somebody gives a term called Java, then I separate out a cluster which talks about Java the island, Java the coffee, and Java uh, the programming language uh, without any uh, supervised approach. So this is a clustering based approach, simple. So, yeah. How would you differentiate that from word sense induction? Uh, it's not very different. The point of uh, the from where you start was very different. So the idea of topic expansion was to see how a given topic has been discussed in different corpora. So that's where we started from. For example, uh, when we looked at the word called Europe, uh, we had uh, access to Wikipedia. We had access to one corporate blog. Uh, in corporate blog, it was uh, more about photography and all such kind of things, uh, landscape, rivers, tourism. Whereas in uh, Wikipedia, it is more about uh, world wars. It's the same concept, Europe. So what we wanted to see is uh, how a topic gets its meaning in a given corpus. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it ended up being very similar to word sense disambiguation when we solved the problem. So it can be used for word sense disambiguation, but uh, the, the motive from where it started is very different. So what so do, do we mean? mean by context of the thing? What do you mean by context of the thing? What kind of context is you For you, context is something like a sense. Uh, there are some works. So you try to cluster things and then try to label them based on sense. If it is something more than that, then I'm not aware. Probably so well, I mean, uh, when because Amir asked this question, it mm -hmm. made me immediately think of the GBV mm -hmm. uh, analyses that mm -hmm. we're doing. And there, the problem is that the very same utterance mm -hmm. means something different because of the surrounding political and social events. Uh, the one that comes to mind is the discussion of um, murder um, in South Africa. And, and how that was elevated and so prominent because of the Oscar Pistorius story. So, mm -hmm. so everything having to do with murdering your girlfriend, if it comes out of South Africa during that particular time period, needed to be interpreted with respect to Oscar Pistorius. Everything having to do with murdering your girlfriend in Nigeria didn't, well, may, may not have needed the Oscar Pistorius. So it's that dimension of context that's outside context, outside the text that is relevant to the interpretation of the recovery of the meaning. That is a big worry for us. Yeah, but here what we once again focus only on is general knowledge. So, right. so, so we don't have that. We don't yeah. have any context as such here. Uh, we have aspects uh, which are once again in general knowledge. 
So, so, so what we uh, said is if you can define how a concept distribution looks in your semantic memory defined, then you can probably run the similar algorithm on your Cochrane's graph and try to get uh, your semantic associations. So, uh, so we define something called aboutness. So, aboutness is uh, more about uh, so uh, US is uh, Barack Obama is more about US than being about probably uh, uh, some other place. Yeah. <laughs> very, very difficult example. Very interesting. Come yeah. up with a instantiation yeah. for that. Yeah. So, so you you know that there is an innate notion of aboutness. So. Uh, we try to model our semantic associations based on this. What we said is uh, uh, this uh, concepts relevant to a topic always cluster together in and across episodes and these clusters also contain the topic. So this is our hypothesis. So uh, which what we say is in our abstract notion of semantic memory this is how it looks and uh, we convert this into a Cochrane's algorithm where we say terms relevant to a topic term cluster together in a Cochrane's graph and the clusters also contain the topic term. I think from here it is gets converted into a, a clustering algorithm which probably will discuss how, how does this depend on the corpus, on the selection of a corpus? Because mm -hmm. again, you know, thinking back to, the, to our GBV mm -hmm. corpus, mm -hmm we're collecting from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our conclusion was that it was not sensible mm -hmm. to do one giant analysis. Mm -hmm. And we decided to segment the corpus. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me mm -hmm. that in order to maintain coherence, mm -hmm. you're, you have to make some assumptions mm -hmm. about the scope and the coverage of your, of your, of your, of your corpus. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're trying to connect aboutness mm -hmm in two different, you know, from two different corpuses. So, so what, do you, what do you do about that? So what we say is the aboutness gets derived from the already existing co-occurrence. Okay. So we don't connect it. So if two terms co-occur quite a number of times, a large number of times, then there is a high... Yes, but in what? Uh, co-occurrence is in, in a generic sense. So what, once again, we are... So the, in the whole world? In the whole world. So in your corpus. But uh, can I say something? Yes. So uh, during our work, me and Pavan, we worked on a real-time semantic filter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we were uh, looking at the co-occurrence of hashtags. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, if your event is mm -hmm. something that is uh, about one of the candidates of the presentation, one of the presidents. For example, let's mm -hmm. say uh, Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And one of the times. Uh, Hillary and another candidate meet somewhere, mm -hmm. right, in another event. Mm -hmm. So the co-occurrence is going to bring all of the things about the other candidate True. using the, only the co-occurrence by itself, True. right? True, but how many times? Is the question. So yeah, so this is this is the thing. So in, in real time streaming from Twitter, you will get thousands and thousands yeah. of co-occurrence for that particular temporal right. time, right? right. For right. like a, a day. Right. And then it stops. Then yeah. Exactly. So yeah. how would you... So uh, if you want to do a temporal analysis, uh, at that point of time they make sense, probably after that they don't. So if you say that point of time the, uh, the two candidates meet, so then there is a semantic association between two candidates at that point. But yeah, why, but constrain it, why constrain it just to, for, 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 uh, along the temporal dimensions? Why not constrain it along the geographic dimensions like we did in GPD? Uh, I mean, it's the same no, thing. What, also, 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 what, also. what I'm claiming is you need not constrain it at all. But then you have to wait for long. But the, but the, so the thing is actually if you do not like constrain junk. it, uh -huh. you are going to get a lot of unrelevant data. Junk. Like for example, mm -hmm. irrelevant data. Irrelevant data. <laughs> Sorry, irrelevant data. <laughs> so for example, uh, a lot of people are gonna keep 
talking about making America great again mm -hmm. in the context of about what Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and, and the, uh, exactly the same time, and they would be talking about the event where Hillary and Trump met. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so you have to differentiate mm -hmm. between the content that is relevant to that temporal event that I met with Trump for that exact event. So I don't care about the other content, mm -hmm. the other content that mm -hmm. is related to Trump, mm -hmm. but doesn't relate it to that event. See, if you are planning to get something with general knowledge out of this, time doesn't matter to me. If you want to get something relevant to this time, or this place, then definitely you have to do this filtering. Yeah, but here's the issue. I mean, it's a really interesting issue. I just, I, I love the way you're framing this. The problem is that that there's no meaning to recover unless you have some kind of focused attention on, I would say, a temporal, a temporally constrained segment and a geographically constrained segment. On the other hand, there's no meaning to be obtained without bringing in your semantic knowledge mm -hmm. so it's a it's a it's a it's chicken and egg true. kind of a problem and, and, also, and Ahmed is absolutely right the issue is how how do you handle the dynamism at the at the low levels and adjust the the high level semantic knowledge in and that's really the problem because you do want yeah. to know that Hillary Clinton met Donald Trump on day one and they talked about whatever it is they talked exactly. about and that's the same Hillary Clinton on day 200 and have those connect together. But if we have that evolving knowledge base that he talked about that precisely like define what kind of interaction happened between these two candidates for that exact event then we can actually slice the only relevant data from from that interaction, right? So you want to keep all the episodic events. You want the epi You want a record of the episodes. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go all the way back to yeah. to the episodic yeah. track, and I and I'm inclined to agree with you, which is why I keep fussing with Saeed about so this. Yeah. So actually, I forgot last time the graph approach that you uh, uh, you explained that time. So so the graph is based on the co-occurrence of. Two, terms. two terms? Yes. So how did you distinguish it between topic modeling and your approach? With LDI and your approach? No, we are creating a generic graph where you can run any kind of algorithm. So this is one of the problems mm -hmm. we are trying to solve. Uh, whereas there are other problems called semantic siblings, then there is a problem called topical marker. So what semantic sibling does is uh, if you give terms like car, truck, uh, bus, it will give more vehicles. So now that is based on the similar approach. Same term co-occurrence graph mm -hmm. is used for that. Uh, then there is something called topical markers. Uh, I don't know how many of you are well versed with cricket. Otherwise, that was my favorite example. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so for example, uh, do it anyway. Football. Yeah. How about football? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now say uh, if you know. Uh, uh, baseball. Yeah, baseball. <laughs> uh, bowling, if you know something like that, uh, or run. Huh? So now if I say a run, uh, in, uh, then what sport do you remember? It's usually baseball here, mm -hmm. in, in India it's cricket. So, so one concept uh, is an anchor to another concept. It's not a set of concepts. Just one concept being anchored to mm -hmm. another concept is called topical uh, uh, mar it, it, mar it marks it, so that is topical marker. Then the other uh, problem is uh, this one, uh, which pass this one. This is called topical anchor. So you can can we tell which topic they are talking about? So can I add something actually? So uh, you know, in topic modeling, you have you the document and the background board yeah. and then cluster the actual document. But here, the representation of the document is different and is actually more meaningful. Why? Because you consider the closeness of the world that they are covering together, so there is the edge between them. So, for instance, you know how distance our two words in the document are. So, 
actually, if you, I mean, that's why I asked you. Yeah. So that's that's the See, topic modeling is one so of the. If you run topic modeling here with this consideration, I mean, the uh, graph actually parameters, it might even get much more meaningful. Yes. And, and my question is, why do you want to run a topic model to solve what problem? So that's my question. So. Would you want to cluster this into multiple topics? That's not my, my problem, right? My problem is given one term, you want to get its topics. It's not that there are a set of terms, a set of documents, and then you want to give multiple topics for that. You, yeah. 